also going from Mickey, Aurora, and from me on my 74th birthday. Aurora wants to say hello to everybody and give me lips kisses. Well, Mickey has taken up her position in the corner to ensure that all goes well. Well, first of all, I have to thank everybody who has been gracious enough to send me birthday greetings and nice presents. So thank you everybody for your wonderful birthday greetings and whatever else you have sent me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really nice to be appreciated. <laughs> Thanks. Now, on Saturday evening, I am going to be hosting a house party of friends and one or two other friends who are not going to be staying here to celebrate my 74th birthday. So that's going to be fun. But Thursday evening, no good. You know, 40 and 50 years ago, everybody did everything during the week. Now everybody works and everybody does everything on the weekend. Good change, I would have said. Well, I will plunge right in with some news from on high. I have to tell you, one or two of Harry's friends are very, very concerned at what's going on. They fear that Meghan is leaking against Harry, that Meghan is setting Harry up, that Meghan is subtly giving her messages, that Harry is very taxing to her mental health, and that he's caused great levels of stress, and that he's really impossible, and they are particularly concerned that she has been leaking stuff about their supposedly private family life. For instance, that he wants the children to be more protected and she wants them to be more exposed. Now, there are other things, but I'm going to address that particular issue because my children were protected to a large extent, as are most children in the public eye. They're not hidden away to the extent that Meghan and Harry's children have been. And I understand that that's not necessarily Harry's doing so far, but Meghan is now trying to flip it, according to his friends, to make out that he is this paranoid loon, which to an extent it would appear he is, but that she, by comparison, is an exemplar of stability, which I'm assured she certainly isn't. And of course, once they're exposed, well, <laughs> hello everybody, my faithful followers. This is Megan V, Duchess of Sussex. Today we have Harry Elva, sorry, not Harry, sorry. Today we have Prince Archie Overcoats, special, reduced from $1,799 to just $499 for all you special people who are followers of mine and who uh, assiduously believe everything I say. And then we have 
Oh, and doesn't Lilibet look cute in that darling little dress? And it's only $2,799, reduced from $8,776. And it's made with the finest polyester. <laughs> yes, and for $2,722, you can also buy the coat that goes with it, the winter coat that you can wear in 75 and 80 degree weather in California, the way I do. And that's reduced and that's made in 100% finest acrylic by the finest designers in the world. Meghan Markle, Meghan Markle, and Meghan Markle. And I'm not just giving you such opportunities to join in our special club and special life and have a really wonderful life the way we do. Well, of course, he wants to avoid that. And his friends certainly want him to avoid that. And I have no doubt his family will want him to avoid that. Then there's also the photo op which I am told she went to the dentist, but somehow it managed to get leaked that she went to see a marriage counsellor. Something suspicious going on there. Mm. Very suspicious. I don't know about... Mickey, do you smell a rat? I do. Then there's all of the marching. She did it last year when she was in New York in boiling 80 something heat and she was in fall clothes and she's done it again, which is totally undignified. And now has even her supporters who have up to now defended her right to retain her title, suggesting that maybe she should be prevented from using the title because she, the flagrant marching, the vulgarity of it all, that any royal British duchess, because even though she's not a royal highness, she is still a royal duchess. Sussex is a royal dukedom. And she is breaching every commercial code of conduct by which the British royal family functions. And also that business of the stress patch, well, his Friends are concerned that she is setting up the scenario where she can assert that his mental health issues and his conduct have caused her such stress that she has had to resort to patches and that when it becomes intolerable, she's going to need a divorce and she's going to need at least two houses. <laughs> also, they are concerned that Meghan, who is a fanatic about being thin and has always made sure she was thin except on two occasions, namely after, and listen to what I've said, after the birth of both those children, when she gained weight, after. Normally, women gain weight during pregnancy. They don't gain it after pregnancy. Megan gained her weight after pregnancy, at the very end of the pregnancy. It went on plainly to coincide as one or two people have pointed out, with the desire for breast feeding. Well, she has 
according to friends of Harry's, they think she's on something called Oz Ozempic. I think that's what it's called, Ozempic, which is a diabetic drug that people take to lose weight and that she is now, uh, seems to be setting up the scenario where she's going to be possibly replicating Mama Diana's eating disorders. Except Diana's eating disorder started before her marriage. A friend of mine was there at the very beginning, went in on Diana when she was making herself sick. And Diana said to Sonia, who worked at the palace, oh, don't worry, everything's fine. I've discovered this great way of dieting. Eat all you want and go, ah. That's what started Diana's bulimia. Well, it seems that Megan is yet again Diana Mach too, but everything is in reverse and everything is flipped and everything's artificial, or should we say archificial? Because she seems to float around arch behavior and very artificial conduct. Well, just so you know what his friends are concerned about. And they also are concerned that the wealth of stories which they were privy to about the marriage being in trouble have dried up just as Meghan is moving into a new direction and appears to be throwing Harry under the wheels of the bus. <laughs> Oh dear, isn't it awful? Harry markled by the Markle. Well, he'll at least know how his grandfather and grandmother and father and stepmother and brother and sister-in-law have all felt. Mm. Hansel Pollock says, <coughs> are these highly visible stretch patches the beginning of Meghan Markle's declaration to onlookers? Living with H is so stressful. If I had known about his mental health problems, I would never have stooped to marry him. Oh, woe is me. I'm such a victim. I need to put on the voice. Sorry. Ah, woe is me, Mr. Simil. I am ready for my close-up. I'm such a victim. Gordon, come and rescue me. Buy me a house for 40 million. Put me in it. Make me safe. Let me escape being a target. I'm a target of the Taliban. Sorry to continue. I'm such a victim. I guess I will have to have a protracted daily headline divorce and fleece the nonsensical moron further. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Hansel Pollock. That's what his friends fear. That's what some of his relations fear. That's what people who love him fear. They, they fear that things have moved gears, let's put it that way, that they have changed gears and they, they're moving in a new direction. And the direction is, gotta divest myself of H as long as I can make some money. <laughs> so it's not only his friends who have picked it up, it's you, the viewer, you, the general public, you, the observer. Well, if you can observe it, can you imagine how much more obvious it is to people who know and love him?
At this point, I think I'd like to make a little observation because it was in the papers, I think it was yesterday, how exemplary Catherine Wales's conduct is. That because there are protocols for royals which determine precedence and the wife of a born royal has one rank well i should say one precedence it's really his rank when she is with him and an entirely different rank of precedence when she is not with him and the born royal women when they are together and husbands are not present the born royal women take precedence over the non-birth royals so for instance Meghan would in the ordinary course of life when Harry was a fully paid up royal when Meghan was present with Harry and Princess Anne was present Meghan would have preceded Princess Anne in rank but when they were together on their own Princess Anne took precedence over Meghan and this was very apparent and has been noted when last year April Catherine and Princess Anne who obviously has just had a birthday uh, she's born I think two days before me and so this was all surrounding her birthday and last year april princess anne and catherine did a joint visit to the royal college of midwives and the royal college of obstetrics and obstetricians sorry and gynecologists and while megan always shot in front of everybody including the queen if you recall oh uh, and then queried well maybe i should give way oh no 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 said the queen it's okay you go ahead being a lady well princess anne got out of the car and catherine hung back to allow her to go first she has an impeccable understanding of her place in the scheme of things and i have to tell you it's been my experience in life that people who understand their place in the scheme of things prosper and flourish and create fewer problems than people who don't each of us is extremely important because we are unique and each of us is totally unimportant because we're going to die and we're ir totally replaceable. And there is an awareness of that in certain codes of behavior that make life a lot easier. While those who defy and wish to puff themselves up and make themselves more important than they in reality are not only show a lack of dignity and a lack of awareness of the pantomime of life you could even call it certainly oh you know it's yeah let's call it the pantomime of life and one ultimately if as long as one isn't being oppressed one should come to terms with and 
accept and be happy with one's place in the scheme of things. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't have ambition. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to improve yourself and improve your lot. But it does mean you shouldn't be a pushy oik the way Meghan Markle is. So I just thought I'd drop that little pearl in. Elizabeth Rose says, is she doing the Diana anorexia thing? But Diana was not anorexic. Diana was bulimic. But Harry's friends are concerned that she is going to be playing the eating disorder card to further manipulate him and to further outmaneuver him and to further escape the consequences of her actions. Now, nobody's saying Harry is perfect, and I certainly wouldn't want to be married to somebody like him. However, there's something deeply unsavory about a woman who was perfectly healthy physically, sending messages about emotional disturbance and mental health issues that are fabricated so that she can manipulate and march. Voya Ristka says, surely she knew that building would be discovered to be what it is. This is just another setup. I think everything she does at this point is for the algorithm. The question is why? Who does she think she's controlling her image with this one? She's getting publicity. She's getting clicks. She's getting attention. And I have been contacted by somebody who works in the field who says that contrary to what another contributor said, a lot of decisions nowadays by companies are made of clicks alone. And by the time the decision has been made and discovered that the clicks don't convert into money they are already committed, which of course is partly what would have happened with Spotify and Netflix. So what's she doing? She's milking and working the system. That's what she's doing. Elena Jimenez says, Dear Lady C, first, thank you for your videos. I have learned a lot since I started watching regularly a couple of months back. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really, really love when people actually do enjoy and profit from what I'm trying to do. <clears throat> I really enjoy the way you think. Thank you. I was taught by the Jesuits to think logically. Great thing to be taught. I really enjoy the way you think. I have realized, thanks to you, that I was leaning dangerously towards black and white thinking in my everyday life. Everything seems to be so extreme and designed to get a reaction out of one if one isn't careful. One can fall into the trap of losing nuance. Thank you for being the voice that reminds us of that. If I have succeeded there, God bless you. Thanks. I very much appreciate it. I have a question regarding Megsy Baby. I would love to have your insight on if you have a chance. Do you think she was wearing that coat in the California sun because she wants us to think she is hiding her body? A stress-related weight loss. Meanwhile, she is taking, in my opinion, some weight loss drug 
and loving the results. I watched recently the documentary about Diana in her own words, and I couldn't help but wonder if Megs is trying to lighten Harry to his dad. In that documentary, it seemed like King Charles was responsible for triggering Diana's bulimia. At least that's how it was presented. So in my head, I was drawing the conclusion that Megsy Baby is leaving a trail of weird behavior overdressing in the summer like a mad person. So in the future, she can place the behavior in a context that makes people think about Diana when she was at her, the worst point during her marriage. I apologize in advance for the long comment. I'd love to hear your insight if possible. Much love. Well, again, you have hit a nail on the head that is concerning Harry's friends. So, it's not only obvious to them, it's obvious to you. Well, doesn't that tell you something? I mean, Meghan is as transparent as glass, in my opinion, and I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again. Uh, first of all, Diana, blamed Charles for her bulimia, but Charles was not to blame for her bulimia. Diana's unstable background and childhood with all the turbulence and the emotional chaos was to blame for her bulimia. Diana was not the only sibling to have an eating disorder. Her sister, Sarah, had a eating disorder as well. As I said earlier, Diana's eating disorder started when she thought she had come up with a great way to diet. Eat all as much as you want and go, ah. And that is what started her bulimia. But a lot of people believe Diana because Diana was a great buck passer. Diana had many virtues, but she was very flawed. And she died before she was able to totally coming to her own. She was getting there and it's a tragedy that she died so young because she possibly could actually have ended up turning into the flower that her many virtues suggested she could be and that her failings due to her and it all rarely goes back to her childhood, which caused huge problems within her marriage, because it, the royal family discovered on the honeymoon that Diana had imploded, that she had developed bulimia and that she was cracking under the strain of going from being an ordinary girl into an extraordinary situation and anybody was going to have problems adjusting no matter how healthy they were but you know people like to go for the simplistic option and diana she went for this for the blame option but she didn't do it at first because when I started writing Diana in private, her story was that she and Charles were hopelessly incompatible and the marriage had broken down under the weight of their incompatibility and she wanted out because she didn't like the restrictions of the royal system. And she is the one who changed the blame and, the, and started to play the blame game halfway through, a quarter way through the writing of the book. 
People don't have to believe it. Ultimately, I don't really care what people believe. You know, I know an awful lot of people don't believe it because they want to sanctify Diana. It would be nice if they believed it because it doesn't pin Diana on a hook, particularly she's dead aside from anything else. And to an extent, it absolves the king of responsibility, which he never had and which she tried to blame him for possessing. But people can believe what they want. I will say what I know to have been the truth and who wants to accept it, accepts it. Who doesn't want to, they don't have to. It really is a matter of complete indifference to me if they don't accept it. It's not affecting my life one way or the other. But Diana was calculated in blaming Charles because she wanted to leave with her privilege intact and did. She was very successful at leaving with her privileges intact. Meghan has used the real Diana as a template and it would be a pity if Megan gets away with things that really she shouldn't be getting away with. Let me put it that way. Personally speaking, I know from everybody who knows Megan well and who has spoken to me that she has always been fanatical about being thin and she loves food. She also loves liquor. Megan has been very open in the past about her absolute adoration of wine. And she has some of the physical attributes of somebody who has drunk an awful lot of wine, including the emaciated calf muscles. Let's leave it at that. Razor Blade says, King Charles should look into the interference that Harry is performing with the Aspen Institute. Their agenda is to demolish free speech in the USA. This is not a popular agenda for us and goes against our constitutional rights. Charles must disable Harry and Meghan. With due respect, Razorblade, it's not up to the king to disable Harry and Meghan. The, he is the king of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We are a constitutional monarchy with human rights. The United States of America is a constitutional republic with rights. You have the First Amendment. Harry has an absolute right under the First Amendment to try to, to, to say whatever he wants. The fact that the British royals are not allowed to interfere with politics doesn't mean that the king can prevent him. The king, there is, there are protocols and if Harry and Meghan choose to disobey them and fail to abide by them, the onus then becomes on them. It's not on the king. Harry has an absolute right to try to shut down the First Amendment if he doesn't agree with it. I happen to agree with you. I think it's wildly inappropriate that Harry is on the Aspen Institute, but it's not up to the British monarch or the British government or the British people to 
shutting down. It's up to you Americans. You are American. But if you shut him down, you are violating his right of free speech. Do you see the dilemma? I always think it's preferable that people espouse views that one disagrees with and are allowed to espouse them. But I do think it's appropriate that a British prince is sitting on the Aspen Institute and trying to alter the American Constitution. You're the guys who fought the American War of Independence. You're the winners. You have to accept responsibility for your victory and act accordingly. And it's up to you what to do, you as Americans. It's a difficult one. I know it's a difficult one. Harry should not be doing it. But just because he shouldn't be doing it doesn't mean he doesn't have a right to do it. Velvet Farmer says, re his Singapore trip. I was just watching the 260 people return their polo tickets and left the polo match. How much did it cost to fly polo ponies and stable staff around the world? They are saying his visit is just an utter flop and raises nothing. He's trying to be a playboy prince. He is a playboy prince. He always was. In his gap year, he didn't want to do any of the work that William did. His gap year lasted two years. He always was a playboy. He's a dilettante. He has the attention span of a newt except where his obsessions are concerned, such as, gotta shut down the press, gotta shut down the press. They might not just speak the truth. <gasps> well, what else was he going to do to raise money for Santa Bali? You know, raising money for charity, and I speak as somebody who was in 1990, I think it was, came, listed as number three in the top 40 charity fundraisers in this country. We were all on pay, not like nowadays where everybody gets a shed load of money for doing what we did for free as our obligation and duty to society. Payback time. You need to provide entertainment, an occasion that people want to be a part of. And yes, flying polo, polo ponies across the world is very expensive, but you can depend upon it. Nacho Figueras has figured out a way for them to make money out of this. He is in the polo business and he's very good at it it is a sport and if people decided that they weren't getting value for money and returned their polo tickets and left the polo that's well within their rights i don't comment one way or the other in terms of a genuine attempt to make money for a charity. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, I'm not going to cast any stones. What else was Harry going to do? Actually, I tell you what else he could have done. They could have, he, he, he could become a troubadour. He could take part in Tableau Vivant. That's what he could do. The prince and the pauper updated. Hmm, that's one. Romeo and Juliet, number two. 
bit long in the tooth, but Harry and Meghan, I think, could star in that. I think people would pay good money, don't you? Oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo. <laughs> Can you imagine? Megan is a 15 year old Jean Fee, and she's still, but she still tries it. Oh, I'm so young, I'm so innocent, I'm so demure, I'm just so proper and classy. <laughs> Jay Tate says, Dear Lady C, I was surprised to hear Ingrid Seward say she feels me again, always dresses beautifully, but my thoughts are the opposite. What are yours? Love everything about you, Lady C, but most of all your intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I can't abide Ingi Sua, as I've always called her. Well, not always. I met Ingi Sua in the mid 80s. And she was perfectly pleasant and rather pathetic. But she was pleasant, and so one was pleasant in return. Then she, I don't remember when she got a job with editing Majesty magazine, which is a teensy weensy little thing, but she works at it. We need to give credit where it's due. She works at it and she has been assiduous at working at it for decades. Then she married a creep called Dross Benson, whose claim to fame was that he had been to Gordonstown with his with with Prince Andrew. Oh, uh, I've met his brother, who's rather nice. I first met him at Humayun Mazandi's party the night that the Shah of Iran left Iran. Humayun, who died recently, she died as Lady Renick. She was Mrs. Joe Mazandi. She was very rich. She was a great character. Uh, she used to have her chauffeur drive the Rolls Royce behind a taxi until he got to know London. <laughs> this would have been about 1978. And I went to a party that she had in January 1979 and it was the saddest party that I've ever been to because that's the night the Shah and the Empress Farah left Iran. And I met Dross, as I call him, and his then wife, Zoe, who was absolutely lovely, but he was always a creep and a jerk. And it was so obvious and a typical third-rate hack journalist who, because he'd been to public school, uh, thought that he was somehow special, but he was really odious and dreadful. And as you can see, I never liked him from the word go, but I liked her. Fast forward to 1992. My book, Diana in Private, is going to be published. And my then publisher has met Dross and Ingi. And the book is a hot topic. So my publisher asks me if I will do a small, I don't remember what, but maybe a hundred words for Ingi and as a favour to him. And I don't remember what I was going to be. It was nominal because they don't have any money. I think I might have been paid, going to, I agreed 30 or 50 or 60 pounds, whatever. I agreed it uh, via my publisher. And then the article was published to coincide 
with the book. But when the book came out, there was a huge pile on from the press saying, oh, oh, what Lady Colin Campbell's saying is nonsense. There's nothing wrong with the Wales's marriage. How dare she say Diana has a, a, an eating disorder? How dare she say that Diana has a lover called Jane Stewart? How dare she say Prince Charles has a girlfriend called Camilla Parker Bowles. How dare she say everything? Of course, that turned out to be true. <laughs> and what did Inge Sewer do? She never paid me what she owed me. And we have a good friend in common who knows that I cannot abide Inge Sewer. I never liked her. I gave her a chance. She behaved in the most appalling manner. I mean, I'm sorry. You don't commit to pay somebody for something, publish it, and then don't pay them. I call that bad behavior. And she knows I cannot abide her. Also, I could say things about Ingrid Seward that would embarrass her in the most dreadful way about her personal life, which I will decline to say at this point. But Ingrid will know that I know everything about her personal humiliating personal life. And as you are discovering, even though I dislike the woman intensely, I will not at this juncture stoop to actually unmasking her and humiliating her publicly. What I will say, however, is she has no style, she has no taste. Uh, if she says that Megan dresses well, just look at her and see how she dresses to understand why she thinks Megan dresses well. So, I think that's answered the question and you have drawn me on a subject and discovered that I can be extremely catty and to the point when I wish to be. But I will again point out that the really hot, wonderful stuff that would absolutely humiliate her to the nth degree which I know all about because, and not through our mutual friend, but through the husband of someone else who I don't particularly like, and she doesn't like either for very good reason. And more than that, I'm not gonna say. Karen, Combs says, Dear Fabulous Lady C, <laughs> I'm sure you now think they're catty Lady C as well. Do you believe the rumours that Cath Princess Catherine has been reaching out in late night calls to the Red Menace? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I believe in the Tooth Fairy. I believe in pigs flying. Go on. Aurora, come, jump on Pig Airline. Let's go on a trip to California. I Let me put it this way. If Catherine were reaching out to the Red Menace, as you put it, do you honestly think that she would be leaking it. It's leaked. Where do you think the leak emanated from? 
the lies, the constant dis and misinformation that emanate from certain quarters are so overwhelming and so constant, it rarely behooves you to take the view with people like that that I ended up taking with my ex-husband. When I discovered that you couldn't rely on a thing he said, I stopped believing everything he said. I didn't accept a word he said. Not a word. I don't believe or accept a word Meghan and Harry say unless I can verify it independently or I have knowledge that allows me to know that it is near to or possibly the truth. Catherine reaching out in late night calls to the Red Menace. <laughs> Whatever next. Chantal Schultz says, Lady Colin Campbell, I have a question. Harry has anxiety about Paps when he is with Mugzit, but when he is away abroad, he is absolutely beaming and relaxed for the Paps and always was. Oh, I'm terrified. It freaks me out. One flash at a time takes me right back. <laughs> oh, hi, 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 hi. How are you guys doing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Isn't life fantastic? I'm just having this wonderful time of my life. Oh, I forgot I've got to be. I, 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 I need to be suffering. I need to be suffering. Again, the wild inconsistency. But on a daily basis, they show us there's nothing they say or do that doesn't contradict something they have previously said or done. Both of them. Him especially in certain respects. Having said that, I am delighted to see that he had sufficient decorum and sufficient finesse to conduct himself the way he should have been behaving until practically the end because he was jocular, he was charming. I mean, he was a very sort of hail fellow, well met, uh, skirting on the issue, on, on, on the bounds of being a rabble rouser. But he because, I mean, rarely it's, you know, Prince should be going, yeah, 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 come on, yeah, 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 the way he was doing. But I get that nowadays that sort of thing might be acceptable to certain circles and, and might actually even be viewed as admirable because... You know, he's being hail fellow well met. So it's not dignified and it rarely skirts on rabble rousing. But you can, I think one can cut him possibly some slack there. But you can't cut him slack with what comes next. Tabitha Collins says, has anyone seen the recent Singapore Polo Awards ceremony. I have to say that I was quite surprised at Harry's strange behaviour. My nose is itching all of a sudden. I don't know why. As although he and his team lost, he was the first to grab the trophy and was reluctant to relinquish it whilst being photographed. Everyone else there, including the winning team, seemed at a loss at just how to react to him. I have to admit that I was shocked at his crass behavior. He obviously never thought that he would lose the match, 
but he still managed to get a photograph of himself holding the trophy. I saw it. And yes, I agree. Crass is the right word. Harry has blown his mind. It's obvious. He's blown his mind. Oh. Uh, Daria, great grassy. Peas of a pod. Do we need more of an explanation than that? Such brains as he had have long since been blown. And the behaviour came across as childish, infantile actually, and unseemly. I'm sure he would have liked us to believe he was being jocular, but he was really... <laughs> It's my toy. I, it's my toy. No, sorry. Let's just take it. It's my toy. It's my toy. Sorry, that's not Harry. It, 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 it's my toy. It's my toy. I'm going to hang on to it. Hang on to it. It's my toy. I'm not giving it up. It's my toy. You need to have pity, pity as well as compassion for somebody whose brains have been blown. I don't know what's got into me while I have such sniffles. Aurora, get me some coke and let me try to clear my passages. Go on, Coca-Cola, Diet Coke. Sue Regan says, is it possible that marrying Trevor after so many years of their relationship was a way of burying her Soho lifestyle in preparation for marrying into the royal family? Sue Regan, you've got the wrong end of the stick. Meghan's Soho days started after she decided her marriage to Trevor was limiting and he was expendable, notwithstanding all the time she had said, oh, Nikki, I, oh, Nikki, I just don't know what I'd do without Trevor to Trev, Trev. If anything happened to him, I'd die. I love him so much. I love him so, oh gosh, I just met the Trudeaus. I have met the Mulroneys. Mmm, Cory Vitiello is going to really be able to wrangle me into a better class of person. Those that wedding and engagement ring and better be sent back post facto. Mm. But that came after. Sorry, sorry. That came before the Soho lifestyle. The Soho lifestyle, the introduction to Soho House was the start of Meghan upscaling from Trevity Trev Trev, the loyal, the loving, the affectionate, the really decent hustler. Yeah, he was a hustler, but he was an honest and decent hustler. But he wasn't classy enough for her at the end of the day but she's got true class now my cold is coming on again better take a spliff to get rid of it oh 
Great class, Doria. You're really the expert. Her father says that the degeneration of Megan as a personality and a character started once she linked up with the Soho House crowd. That's what he's told me, and I'm sure he will have no objection to my repeating it here and now. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. Please keep the questions and comments coming in so I can discuss with you what you want us to speak about. God bless. Bye-bye. And if you have really enjoyed this, please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell and take good care.